Uh, we've got a Vespa 150, a 2008 Vespa S up on the lift tonight. We're going to have some serious fun upgrading this thing. Uh, we're going to go over in great detail the step-by-step -step installation process of the uh, Melosi 190cc cylinder kit. We're also going to do an upgear kit from Polini that's going to increase the final drive ratio with the back tire to enable us to uh, cruise more at like freeway speeds while the engine is essentially not working quite as hard turning fewer RPMs. Uh, we all know and love Robot. He's done, how many, robot, how many of these kits do you think you've done over the years? Uh, probably 62, I think. <laughs> Counted up the first kit I put in back in uh, 2002. Yeah, you probably got each one kind of dated. Uh, we won't go into that kind of detail quite yet, um, but we'll talk uh, difference in compression versus stock cylinder. Um, it's 10 and a half to one with the Melosi. What do we get, Robot? You're up to 11 and a half to one. So big boost in compression there. Uh, as far as an increase in displacement, you're going from 150 cc's to 62.5 millimeters up to a 70 millimeter uh, cylinder piston, and you're right up to 187. Kind of just rounded up to 190. Everybody calls it the 190 kit. So we'll go ahead and get our cameraman to kind of pan down. We'll do. Uh, we'll show you like a stock cylinder versus uh, the 190 cylinder. One thing we'll say too about you know Melosi and the manufacturing quality standards that they employ, like Robot and I back in 2011 had the privilege of touring their facility for a day and a half. Uh, as a Melosi distributor, they opened, they welcomed us with open arms. We were completely blown away and thoroughly impressed with, you know, the quality of the manufacturing, you know, the, uh, the control aspects, the packaging, their entire operation. Uh, and he and I would both argue that, you know, the manufacturing standards that they employ are arguably higher than that even of Piaggio, and for good reason, because they are manufacturing a performance-based product, so it does need to be held to kind of, uh, you know, a higher uh, specification. But we'll go ahead and we're down here on the cylinder. Uh, Robot will kind of talk about the uh, composition of the, uh, the aluminum and the, uh, the cylinder walls, what that's made of. Uh, the Melosi's got a nickel sil silicon coating. Uh, you can have a tighter piston to cylinder clearance and also the cooling is a little better versus the stock cylinder, which is aluminum, but it's got a cast iron sleeve. So another reason why, you know, the Melosi kits can be a little bit more expensive, you're dealing with, you know, advanced technology really in the manufacturing process alone. So there's a stock piston. Robot, I'll grab that Melosi piston. And there's the Melosi 70 millimeter piston right there. Kind of show the skirts, the size of each piston. This is made by the same manufacturer as the original stock one, also. As you can see in the inside of the skirt. So this is these specifications. Yeah. So this is our old cylinder. We're not really gonna you know talk about this anymore. Kind of put that off to the side. Uh, additional products that come with the Melosi cylinder kit. We talked about the cylinder, you get the piston, you obviously get a set of rings, so there's the two compression rings and the scraper ring. Uh, you get a set of instructions. Uh, which are in several different languages, English being one of four. Uh, there is some good technical information in here. Um, but, you know, you, you have to kind of rely on some expertise as well. That comes with uh, a head gasket as well as a base gasket. And I think we talked about the cylinder wrist pin and the two wrist pin clips. Pretty standard. In order to install the kit, there's a couple other gaskets we're going to need in addition to what's included with the Melosi kit to successfully install this. Uh, the valve cover is going to be separated, so we've included the valve cover gasket. Uh, I always use the original Piaggio base gasket. It's got a silicone coating on there, and it's less likely to weep oil from the base. Uh, the original Melosi one, for some reason, doesn't. And I go to the 4 tenths gasket to, to boost the compression ever so slightly. Um, I've taken apart many, many of these engines and they always have a 610 gasket in them. So let's explain real quick, Robot. So this gasket comes like as an option from Piaggio in varying thicknesses, is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's 4, four tenths, 6 tenths, and 8 tenths, and you can measure the squish of the, the piston. You know, basically the gap here, there's a, a special Piaggio tool to do that. And nearly every single one I've taken apart has had a 6 tenths um, so gasket, which is the middle one. So what Robot's saying is in order to really maximize the kit, we're going to go ahead and go with an original Piaggio one, but the 410s. So we're actually not really going to use this and just kind of discard that from the Lotus kit. 
And this other, these other gaskets you see here uh, and other components are available as one simple part number on the Scooter West website. So you can kind of buy the cylinder kit and this compilation group of parts and know that you'll have everything you'll need to actually install the cylinder kit. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get boot a pan out a little bit on the camera. And I don't know if we talked about, as far as like technical ability, what's going to be required to actually install this. Obviously, there's a couple Haynes manuals that are available, you know, at Scooter West and elsewhere on the web. But those some good pictures and step-by-step -step stuff. Robot, in your expert opinion, having installed, what was it, 62 of these? Uh, out of a scale of one to five, you know, what number do you think would be required in order to pull this off successfully? I would call this a four. It's definitely not the most difficult job. Uh, you just need to have a fairly complete set of mechanics tools and a decent torque wrench to uh, torque the head bolts, and that's about it. And watch the video, you'll get some tips, uh, go through the manual, read it carefully, um, and also Haynes or the factory service manual might be helpful too. Alright, so I think that's about it. We're going to go ahead and start tearing into this thing. Uh, robot. And use his expertise step by step, show you the process and what it takes to do one of these. Here we go. Bam! All right, we've got the bike up on the lift. Uh, we're blessed to have these nice hydraulic lifts. The nicest thing about these lifts is the ability to chop the front wheel. So this has got a crank style clamp that pinches on the front wheel and keeps basically the entire bike secure. Uh, wouldn't expect the average scooter owner back home trying to do this to have something like this. You can buy a wheel chalk from Harbor Freight National you know, Tool company chain that sells not the highest quality stuff but they sell stuff that gets a job done and you can kind of figure something out with two by fours but it's pretty important that you get the front wheel chopped. Next thing is in order to take the engine out we actually need to support you know the middle section of the bike so the front is secured with the chalk the middle uh, we've got these really nice like uh, scissor jacks so. yeah scissor jacks you know this is a nice like shop lift that's specifically made for motorcycles. Wouldn't expect you to have this either. But any sort of a floor jack will kind of suffice. Vu kind of gets down here. You can kind of see there's a nice flat spot on all the Vespa 150 frames. So you can kind of go right in the middle of this section of the frame, kind of jack that up. And you can kind of see as we tighten this, it kind of lifts the whole motor up. So we got the frame pretty well supported. Now we're going to talk about removing these side fairings. Robot, what do we got to remove body work wise? Actually, first thing is there's the engine access door up here. Uh, which comes out with a simple screw, so take that out of the way, put that off to the side, and then moving on to the rear half of the bike. And you want to remove both, both these skirts. They have two fasteners. Uh, these pull away. Uh, single fastener right here. And you pull this away. Oftentimes the fastener is rusty. Uh, good, good time to change it out. I don't have the part number offhand, but we do carry a fastener both in stainless and the original black oxide fastener. Uh, next, you want to remove the muffler. This has already got a performance muffler here. Uh, any type of muffler mounts with two six millimeter Allen fasteners going into the engine block. And up at the cylinder head under here, there's going to be two brass coated uh, nuts that are ten they need a 10 millimeter socket. Best thing to remove them is this uh, deep swivel uh, 10 millimeter. A little, little harder to find, get, get one from a tool truck if you're going to do this a lot. It's kind of an expensive socket. If you don't have this, you can just use um, a socket and an adapter style wobble. Well, let me ask you this, Robot, because essentially for the cylinder kit, we've got to remove the entire engine from the actual frame of the scooter. Hypothetically, could we say leave the exhaust on to take the engine out, or does that just make it extremely difficult? Uh, it makes it extremely difficult. The exhaust actually is in the way of the uh, hanger, so you need to remove the got exhaust. It. And that's that's a must. Just, okay, yeah. so much for that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta yeah. do. So we're gonna have, next scene. We'll go ahead and take the exhaust off. So continuing with disassembly, robot's gonna remove the uh, back tire. 24 millimeter deep socket, a good healthy impact. This is an excellent opportunity to replace the rear tire since we're going into it so far. Uh, he's gonna move, dump the fluids out. So he's gonna start with the using that same 24. Uh, a little retaining cap that holds the oil strainer in there and then the spin-on style of oil filter. He's using the uh, special tool that we sell at Scooter West. Part number on that is tool oil, OLF4. Uh, so draining the oil out and there you see him pulling the actual strainer out. So it's a good opportunity to take that out. Generally those are more or less reusable. You always want to do a physical inspection, make sure they're not too melted, but clean that. Let all the fluids drain. He's going to actually hop over and do the hub oil, get the tire out of there. And from that point, we'll be ready to uh, 
we'll be pretty close to being ready to uh, pull in the engine out once we get back into the upper well and pull the carburetor out. So there's a special spacer on the wheel, always make sure that's there. There's also a spacer on the inside that fell off. Commonly this actually stays in there, but in this case, it actually fell off, but you definitely want to make sure when you go to reassemble that the sticker spacer is on the inside there and that thinner spacer that looks essentially like a fender washer, see it there, goes on the outside. Good opportunity too to inspect the brakes, clean the dust off, replace those. You see robots cracking the uh, drain bolt for the uh, oil, for the final drive oil. Again, this is really easy, especially once you have the tire out of the way. Uh, there's the crush washer, the brass single-use crush washers. Those should get replaced every time. Part number on that is 000397. So at the point now where we're essentially just letting all the fluids drain, I don't think there's too much more we can really do from... I need to go disconnecting the actual rear brake cable. You want to make sure that's out of the way. That's pro. Yeah, there's a lock nut right here that you need to loosen first. And then you can remove the actual adjuster from the outside here. So yeah, once that, that all the way off. Exactly. Go. That's probably the one thing that people get a little overexcited about and forget to disconnect. <laughs> but yeah, it's important to disconnect everything so the motor will swing out freely. Um, a couple, couple other things. Uh, a little difficult to pull the spark plug cap, but you can get your hand up in there and pop it off, or you can use a long, long set of needle nose pliers. I have a pair there about that long, and you, you got to pull the spark plug cap straight off the plug. If you put an angular force on it, it's going to break the cap. And I see tons of those caps broken. I see the actual spark plugs broken. A couple of wires that need to be disconnected. Uh, you'll see this one up at the top. This is the actual power connection for the, um, the stator. Uh, the fuel injected, injected ones are different. They actually have a connector that's up on this mounting plate up in here. And you could just kind of follow all the wires. Everything needs to be disconnected. That's disconnected right there, a little tab to push off. Uh, this little hose on the air injection, which is only found on the carbureted ones. Got a little clip, use a needle nose or something, push the clip out of the way and remove that hose. Uh, the starter motor's up in here. On the LX and S, the ground strap actually goes to the back of the starter motor. On the older models like the ET4, the ground strap actually connects to the belt cover. And up in here, you'll see a rubber boot. And that's the positive connection to the, um, to the actual starter motor. And it's a 10 millimeter fastener. Use a little open end 10 millimeter wrench to crack that, that fastener loose. Same with the uh, ground strap, it's an eight millimeter fastener or eight millimeter headed fastener. And that's about as far as we'll take it on this side. The seat with the bucket removed. Um, you don't need to remove the whole carburetor, but you could take the intake manifold off. Uh, two fasteners, need an eight millimeter uh, socket. Uh, this is the EVAP hose, it pops out of that clip there. There's two clips that retain the wiring. Um, on the earlier models, it's a little different, figure it out, but those clips, basically you push them, push the little tang, and then the, the hoses and wires pop right out. So that's all pulled out. Uh, you got a vent hose that pulls out of the engine. So the carburetor is kind of separated. Sometimes this little boot will fall off, keep it. I got that thing. Discard the gasket that's in there. Uh, always want to put a rag in the intake, kind of keep anything out of there. Uh, this is your, your crankcase ventilation hose. Oftentimes this isn't very tight, so you can just get a flat blade screwdriver under there. Throw this one-time use clamp out. One thing I've always noticed from uh, watching, having watched Robot done this tons of times is it saves a ton of time to leave all the carburetor stuff attached and he'll actually take a zip tie or some safety wire and just kind of pull this up so it's out of the way once we drop the engine out of the way. I'm holding it for him right now, but you'll see that later in the shop, but it's definitely a time saver. Um, pretty, pretty cool little trick. All right, from the rear, we went ahead and unthreaded the, uh, the cable, the rear brake cable adjuster. You want to take this little nugget out. Uh, sometimes we'll want to fall off. A five millimeter Allen fastener is the thing that holds the actual cable. Move this little hose, get out of the way. Uh, pop the cable out. Uh, right here is a clip that holds the cable and then these two little clips actually go in those little holes here. Uh, loosen those and you want to retighten those otherwise you might end up with the oil pan that leaks. Fold the cable back, get that out of the way. A uh, little air snorkel for the intake of the belt, belt cover. 
helps keep clean air in the belt. Disconnect that. You've got a spring that you need to remove. And you can see it up in here. Um, sometimes a little hard to get out. Actually, if you have the engine down on the center stand, it actually uh, releases tension on that. But basically, you know, it's a little, little difficult to get out. But uh, once you get that loose, so go down with the uh... yeah. It, actually, you can see it. See how the uh, engine actually kind of went up, and when it's on the center stand, it actually releases tension on the spring. But you kind of want to get the spring puller in there and carefully pull that right off. Other way to do it is just actually get the basically put a 17 millimeter. Uh, Thing up. So get that uh, bolt out of the way and you can get, get through the spring and pull that right off of the spring tool. It's a little easier. So there's your spring. Long, the longer one goes up in the frame, the longer half of it. Uh, on the back, you need a 13 millimeter and a 17 millimeter loosens the lower shock mount. And that's the only one you need to take out. Um, the air box is retained by two screws. Number three Phillips. Might want to use a magnet to remove the screws. And take note, there's a star washer and a flat washer on both those. This one will come right, out. So we actually went ahead and reinstalled the tire for one reason only. It makes it so we can easily slide the engine out. And also once the engine is out of the bike, it makes actually for a good base of an actual engine stand. Pretty well designed by Piaggio. Uh, next, the, the pivot bolt that we have loose in, we removed the spring. There's also a spacer in there. Gonna go ahead and pull that out. We have the, the frame supported by the jack here. Sometimes you might need a vice grip or something to pull this out. Keep in mind the spacer's got a groove for that spring. Um, we'll go ahead and start to slide the motor back. And you kind of want to watch the carburetor, air box, all the stuff that I have hanging uh, from a wire. And Steve, my assistant, he's gonna go ahead and lift the frame so that this, this clears the rear end. We'll be able to pull the motor out without removing the rear fender. And if you're up at the top over here, you'll, you'll be able to see that we're almost have the engine you know, completely separated from the scooter here. And kind of watch, make sure you definitely have all the cables and wires disconnected. That's my yes. job on this side. Everything was disconnected, but the wires will kind of tend to hang up a little bit in these clips. So I'm just kind of making sure that's out of the way. And I think we're pretty close to high enough where we could swing the motor around to be able to see the whole motor assembly. Voila, there's the motor. And basically we'll be working on the, the top end of the motor. And you can see it, having the wheel on and the center stand down, it's like a perfect engine stand on you. It works perfect on them. Not too many other scooters have this characteristic of the stand that's with the engine. All right, so we're, we've got the engine set up. We're gonna go ahead and remove all the plastic shrouding, get that out of the way. Uh, Robot's gonna talk about the uh, secondary air supply system here. Essentially this pumps, you know, cleaner air into the exhaust on the carbureted bottles. Robot can kind of give a better, slightly more technical explanation, but. Um. Yeah, basically is on the LX's, they didn't have the system on the ET4's, any of the LX and S's that had the carburetor, it basically has a little uh, one-way valve and it introduces uh, air, air into the exhaust system, allows the engine to run a little bit cleaner. Um, one thing about this, if you're running an aftermarket pipe, so you'll get some backfire whenever you're off the throttle, like kind of a backfire on deacceleration. Um, we optionally sell, there's a, a block off plate that replaces the gasket that comes out of here. Um, you could replace that or you can leave it. Sometimes when these screws come out, they'll take the stud with it. It's just the way it is. Don't want to use the 10 millimeter uh, outside, kind of can't get it by the pipe. Use a six millimeter Allen, slips right in there. See those are pulled away. There's the actual rubber boot up in there. And this will pull straight down and off, off the, um, the studs and you'll see the gasket that you could discard. 
Yeah, and so what Robot's saying is essentially for off-road use only, uh, you can actually put a block-off plate that we offer at uh, Scooter West that makes it so you can kind of eliminate this tube and all that other stuff. Right, Robot? Correct, yep. Yeah. Uh, the shrouds come off pretty easy. There is an order to how everything comes off. There's a spark plug door. Uh, little clip pulls away, this little tab right here. Sometimes this tab's uh, quite worn out, so perfect time to change out the spark plug door. Um, got two fasteners right here, each side. You got a yeah. fastener back here that I'll deal with. And again, this rag is just, you know, keeping anything from falling down the intake there. Again, a little bit lesser important on this bike because you're taking the cylinder off anyways, but that's always good practice anytime you have one of these motors out of the bike. Nothing worse than having something fall down in there and ruining the cylinder head. So robot's kind of zipping along on yeah, four, you know, the shrouds. Four millimeter Allens for these ones on the older engines. They actually have a Phillips, but anything that's newer has either Allen or sometimes even Torex on the real new stuff. You can see the uh, fan covers uh, coming loose. Uh, Steve's working on the last screw that's on, on the left side of the engine. Kind of pulled this away. Kind of got to guide the, uh, the air tube. This pulls away. And again, like we well documented, Robot's done this a trillion times before. Obviously, you're doing this for the first time. Pay close attention to where each fastener goes uh, so you can ensure that you put it back together uh, as seamlessly and correctly as possible. Lower cover pulls off and there's um, little tabs that engage into these holes. And the top one pulls off. It's a rubber gasket. You can get out of the way. This it's, uh, has any cracks. be a good time to replace it. And boom, you see the bare aluminum parts of the engine here. And you're able to manually turn the motor over with the fan right here. And I'll show you the marks on timing this engine a little bit later. I kind of know exactly where this is just from doing it so many times. It's on the compression stroke right now. And I have it top at center pretty, pretty close. And at this point, Robot, it, would you normally ever have to even like crack into the belt cover or? Um, if you're just going to do the top end kit, you don't need to crack into it. We're going to put the, uh, the overdrive kit and also change the uh, weight of the rollers in there the, you know, the work well with the overdrive kit that we're going to put in there. Uh, there's many other performance options for the transmission, such as uh, various brands of uh, variators. Um, I personally have a Melosi one on my bike, but there's other brands that we offer, um, different belts. If your scooter has uh, close to 7,000 miles, be a good time to put a new belt in here. Uh, once you do a performance setup, you definitely want to stay on top of your maintenance. You know, the, the standard maintenance on these is around every 3,500 miles. I would shorten it to around every 2,000 2, miles, maybe 3,000 at the very most. Um, keep on the oil changes, valve adjustments, the belts. All right, so we've gone ahead and removed the valve cover. Uh, four fasteners, pretty simple, straightforward. There's a one-time use valve cover gasket that's in the kit of replacement parts. Uh, that we sell at Scooter West. We've also taken, we've also waited, removing the spark plug until this time. A new spark plug will also be coming uh, in that kit of parts. Uh, we replaced that thing with a nice like iridium uh, tipped NGK plug. It's way easier. I don't know if you've ever tried to take the spark plug out of the uh, out of the cylinder head with the frame in the bike, but it is no fun process. So it's nice to actually be able to take this out at this time. Uh, next, uh, now that we have access to the cam sprocket, we want to set the engine to top dead center on its compression stroke. And if you read, read up on how engines work, you can kind of cover that a little bit further, but I basically show where you need to set the engine. Um, on the sprocket, there's two marks. There's one that says 2V, and there's one that says 4V. This sprocket's actually used on other engines. This engine is a two-valve engine, so the 2V indicates that it's the top dead center on the compression stroke of the two valve engine. So the little arrow points to that little uh, cam chain pin right there and it lines up with that pip in the top of the, um, the cam bearing uh, journal right here. You can see the pip, so I got that lined up. And on this side, you can see I can easily turn the engine over without the spark plug. Uh, if you have this cover on, there's a pip right here and another pip right here and if you have this on you'll be able to sight it and that will if they both line up that's at top dead center and like um, for example was that if you were adjusting the valves that's when you would use those two reference yeah correct, correct. yeah 
and basically you need to reference the flywheel top dead center which is pissing at the top of the stroke with the cam when we put it back together. Very critical step to put one of these together. And oftentimes I'll just mark it since I know right where it is. Put a mark on the edge and a little mark on the flywheel. Make it nice and easy to see versus trying to find the marks that are engraved on the flywheel. And my question to Robot was like, why do this since we're taking the whole thing apart? Uh, and Robot had a good answer to that. What was that again, Robot? Uh, basically, you want to have the engine at top dead center on the compression stroke the, uh, when you tear down the engine just because it releases the tension on the, um, the valves. Um, the valves are both going to be closed at this point, so everything's going to be a little easier to take apart. I mean, it is possible to take the engine apart in other positions. Not really the best idea. When you assemble it, it's, it's absolutely critical. Every, the piston is set to top dead center by the flywheel marks and the cam sprockets lined up to the mark. And while we got it a part two, let's go ahead and pan over and look at the uh, variator and clutch just real quickly. It's a nice opportunity to kind of see the inner workings of the engine with all the covers and stuff off. Robot will get over there on the flywheel. He'll actually spin the motor over. Why don't you go ahead and do that, Robot? You can kind of see essentially, you know, the connecting, you know, this drive belt essentially connects you know, the variator, which is the front pulley, to the uh, driven pulley, also known as the clutch pulley. But it's good to, you know, it's a nice opportunity to actually see the inner workings of the engine. Really kind of have a good appreciation for the simplicity of them. And you can watch the valves, basically, the motor's on its intake stroke, actuates the intake valve, comes around, compression stroke, you see it's at the 2V, and the spark plug fires right around then, goes around, and the exhaust valve starts to open, and the piston's actually coming back up. So you'll see the mark for your top dead center on the flywheel coming back up. And it's opening and closing exhaust to expel the gases and coming back around and starting the in intake cycle back again. Essentially, back. That's, that's the full cycle of a four-stroke engine. Four-stroke engine, that's why they call it four-stroke. There's four, four steps to the whole cycle of it. And once the bike is actually running, we'll do a cool shot of this test cover we have so you can actually see what happens with the transmission when the bike is actually running in a different RPMs. Because essentially both of these pulleys kind of move and contract at different rates and that's essentially what controls, you know, the final drive and ultimate drive speed of the back wheel. You know, definitely simple, uh, simple, smooth, but refined. It's cool. All right, next we're going to go ahead and tear down the uh, top end of the engine. A uh, couple things to the order of how you remove some of the fasteners on it. Uh, pretty critical. This is your cam chain tensioner. You're going to crack the actual center bolt and pull the thing, and it's spring-loaded, so be prepared for a spring to come out. Spring comes out, there's an O-ring in here. So set that aside. Now that you have that still top, set at top dead center here, uh, we can remove, go back to this, we'll remove these two here. These are the, hold the cylinder down off the cam chain tunnel. And before I remove the tensioner actually, I kind of was going to jump the gun and remove it. You want to uh, grasp the flywheel. Uh, there is a special Piaggio holder tool, but the cam chain is uh, plenty strong enough to hold back the force of cracking this fastener open. Take that off. The little bell, you can see there's a small hole that lines up with the Allen fastener. Uh, four millimeter Allen. Crack that. This little spring, I'll show how to put it back together. Uh, you want to turn the motor backwards a little bit. Pull that up and put your finger under here because there's going to be a plastic uh, little spacer it's going to hold and you can see I retain that spacer versus letting it drop down in the bottom of the engine. We turn the engine back to top dead center mark. Remove this fastener. This is the counterweight for the, um, the automatic decompression system. All those parts are part of the automatic decompression system allows the engine to start easier with a smaller size starter. And crack the two uh, tensioner. Another thing to check when we pull the tensioner out, if you have a, a very high mileage motor, you'll be able to um, kind of uh, see where the position of the tensioner is. 
this tensioner is only out a couple clicks. If you had a high mileage motor, this may be out this far. Wow. If it's out that far, it's time to change your cam chain. Uh, the cam chains are real durable in these scooters. I've seen examples have 50,000 miles and the cam chain maybe is worn to about that position. Still has a couple more clicks you know, left, basically. Now in the factory service manual, do they say after so many clicks, replace the cam chain or is it not necessarily uh, I think it's a noted, set measurement or something Yeah, it's, like it's noted in the GTS manual. Uh, GTS is a little different. All these engines use different length uh, cam chains. Uh, based on the stroke of the engine. And I assume there's a couple of cam chain tensioners just like any other motor, correct? Correct, yeah, there's some sliding parts and yeah, you may yeah. want to inspect those if you tear down the motor. Rarely ever see those worn out. Uh, we'll pro pop the sprocket off, kind of work it off. And there's a plate that's behind there. Clean all those parts. And still, it's right at the top dead center, you could kind of see it turns easy. If it wasn't a top dead center, it'd be very difficult to turn. Um, crack these two small fasteners. One thing to note is the, the rockers are actually identical, both the intake and exhaust rockers. They basically just flip them around on the shaft right here. Uh, you want to return them to the respective uh, spots, so I went ahead and marked the top one is intake, and that's where the carburetor goes. And EX on the exhaust one there. You want to push the pin out. So even though they're the same, you want to make sure you put them back in the, in same, the same fashion? Correct. And why is yeah. that? Just because the wear, the way they wear to the... Yeah, they're, they're worn to the cam. Um, the adjusters have been close, close to the correct adjustment for the valves. Got it's it. a little easier to put together. Uh, pin pops out. You pop the two uh, rockers out. And there's a wave washer that goes in between the two. You can see there was a little resistance to pull them out. A couple things to check on these. You know, the pin, I rarely ever see them loose on the pin, so that's not really an issue. Sometimes the hard face is actually worn on these rockers. These are the updated design rockers that have a hardened pad that's actually adhered some way to the actual uh, powdered metal rockers. Uh, some of the older rockers, they just hard face onto the actual thing, and I've seen some of those wear out. These ones rarely have problems. What is the oldest, what's like the first year you've seen this particular style? Uh, this style is probably in the last four or five years. I don't know the exact Got cutoff it. date, but this is the newer style. And again, this is a model year 2008 scooter, but you can see what he's talking about. You can kind of see the two different metals, the way, you know, he's taking the hardened surface is adhered to the actual you know, cast, what the rockers cast yeah, the and, iron, yeah. Yeah, and these look look absolutely perfect. And there's no wear, no galling. You know, if you look at photos of examples of what a galled surface look like, you know, these have a, a nice polished surface. Originally, they were probably ground. Um, now the cam will pull right out. Again, inspect the cam. If you had uh, rockers that had the hard face worn out, most likely your cam's going to be worn out too. Again, you could see some of the Surface is polished where the metals have, have kind of, they ride on each other. Also check this, in the factory service manual there is specifications for this. Uh, rarely ever see problems with this. If you run the motor out of oil a couple times, you're probably going to ruin this plain bearing surface along with a couple other I guess real quick on the camshaft, since uh, I think there's a lot of questions about camshaft, explain like each different thing real quick. Like what's what, you know? The, the journals on? Yeah, yeah exactly. the, the, the various journals and uh, stuff. Basically, this cam's in there, and top dead center is on the compression stroke is where the lobes face away from the actual rockers. So it'd be, when we re reinstall it, it'd be more or less like that. And basically, your intake lobe is right here. And when it comes around, it actually, the lobe actuates this, and it, the rocker basically acts on the valve and you can see the ratio is different. So maybe, you know, this has about five millimeters or four millimeters of lift. You know, it translates into 11 or 12 millimeters of lift just based on the angles of how this is manufactured. Got it, so the two lobes and then of course the journal where the actual camshaft spins in the cast aluminum head. Yeah, and go ahead, there's actual measurements for this and if, if you don't see any type of galling or scratches, it's most likely uh, serviceable and reusable. And it's quite a tight fit. You know, there's pressurized oil that lubricates that. Uh, next thing, you want to crack the uh, 
12 millimeter fastener or the 12 millimeter headed uh, flange bolts in a crisscross action and they're fairly tight so I kind of have a long wrench here you don't want to use an impact on these kind of cracked it about an eighth of a turn basically go back and forth and we can go to about a quarter turn next round and you did say that the uh, like the cam journal is uh, lubricated by high pressure oil. That's like, correct. Like what kind of pressure is high pressure? Uh, it's around what is that? I think it's like two and a half bars average or something. Okay, and that is a that's different from say for example a GY6 150 motor where Th those are a low pressure uh, lubrication system because they the cams actually ride on a bearing on a ball bearing a yeah. ball bearing and actually I've seen more of those fail than these. I see the ball bearings fail. You'd think that the ball bearing would be a better design, but they, for some reason, they must have inadequate lubrication or poor quality bearings. I've seen Kimco's, Genuine's, of course, tons of the Chinese ones fa fail. These rarely ever fail as long as you keep oil in them. The oil pumps rarely ever have a problem in these. Uh, the oil pressure can be checked. If this, this is the actual oil pressure switch, it can be removed and there's a special test, test set to measure the oil pressure. All right, all the fasteners uh, required to tear down the top end are all off. Uh, next comes the fun. Boom, we're gonna take the top end of the engine apart right now. Nice, so let's do it. We'll give it a little jiggle. Off comes the cylinder head, cylinder head comes off. It's gonna leak a little bit of uh, engine vital fluids. See these dowels? Sometimes they're a little bit stuck in there, but these ones are pretty fresh. They usually come right out. I'll wipe this down a little bit, get some of the excess oil off. Robot will continue on the cylinder, and then we'll come back to the uh -huh. cylinder head. Uh, you got the old uh, head gasket. Pull that away. Definitely don't need that. Uh, this lower uh, cam chain tensioner uh, guide. Remove that. Kind of look look in there for abnormal wear. It kind of looks like just a racetrack if it's in good condition. And again, you said these. Rarely wear rarely. out. Maybe if you maybe if you're gonna do a cam chain, you'd always do these or something. Yeah, if you maybe if you replace a cam chain real high mileage, you want to replace it. I've seen them melted from an engine that's lost the fan. Okay. Just being a plastic part. Yeah, it's like a hard, like almost like a phenolic style of plastic or something like that. So it kind of leaks a little oil as you're pulling it apart. Don't worry about it. You can see the engine's at top to center. You can have fun with it. Hold the cam chain if you're gonna to want to crank it over. And kind of watch the action of it. Go back to top dead center. Uh, sometimes the base gasket's a little little trickier. And there's two dowels that retain it from basically, what is it, the left or right side of the engine or something. Kind of the same size as the cam channel, but you need to get some type of mallet, give it a couple taps, mostly on this side. Yeah, I can see the thing as he's kind of tapping, he's pulling with his left hand, pulling yeah. like an upward pressure using his thumb on the stud. And as he was tapping that, you can kind of see the thing start to pull up. And the gasket's kind of going to be sticky sometimes. The higher the mileage, the more the gasket's going to be stuck. Uh, you could kind of pry it away. I'll keep on pulling this. I'm not going to actually pull the um, piston all the way out. I'll pull just enough to expose the pin, you know, the rings are still actually in the cylinder. Um, good idea to throw a rag in the, the, the crankcase hole right now because we're going to pull out the small, small little uh, thing. I'll actually show the detail of removing this clip. And why, why don't we want to just pull the cylinder all the way off? Uh, just makes it a little easier to control this clip. Got it. Little, so. so it's a little tip. Essentially, yeah. he's using the cylinder to hold the piston in place so we can more easily remove the uh, circlip retaining like he can remove the the, the wrist pin retaining clips oh, oh. that's a cool trick but i like that yeah man. otherwise it's like you're stuck holding this with your off hand and it's wiggling around as you're fighting it so you pop that out and this should be fairly simple to pull out so you notice what he is he pulled the the circlip from the one side and then he used the same needle as he's using to just push perfectly down the wrist pin he's got a preferred pair of uh, needle nose pliers. You want to use a diameter? Yeah, real real sharp. There's actually, I have the Piaggio tool that reinstalls those and removes them. Uh, it's a pretty cool tool, but it ends up- Kind of know, excessive, yeah. Excessive and it takes a long time to set up. So just using a really good set of needle nose 
does the trick. They got a little groove. So now I got the pin out. The cylinder is going to pull right away from the connecting rod on the crankshaft. And again, that cylinder base gasket's torn. We don't care about that. You know, that's obviously going to get replaced every time you pull a top end just off on really any motor, really. And you can see uh, detail on this. There's the little uh, relief. You can get the needle nose under there and grab it and kind of lever it away, and that will remove the clip. You can see right there, pull the clip out. And this is a good set of needle nose. Can't do this with a crappy set. Good serration in there. Might want to uh, get something a little better than the Harbor Freight needle nose. Do that job right there. It's not very fun to lose the clips. And now as the robot was taking that off, you can kind of see there's uh, what appears to be like some Sharpie numbers. There's number two on the right hand side of the crankcase, number two on the main and left hand side of the crankcase, and then there's some other numbers down here that look like some three digit numbers. What are those all about, robot? Uh, these, these numbers are when they machine the cases, there's some type of matching serial number or something to when the, you know, they're only when the engine's uh, machined. The twos usually correspond to the, uh, the category of the crankshaft. Uh, they have two different sizes of these crankshafts. It's basically the size of the journal and they have some uh, very small differences in it and it's based on how they machine things. And if you turn the crankshaft over, I'm kind of supporting the cam chain. And why uh, are you always supporting the cam chain? You don't want to let it uh, fall back in and bind up into the cam gear. Got it. Then if that happens and you're deep in, yeah, you're digging I've, deeper into the engine, right? And I've had a customer bring me an engine that they took apart and had it all bound up and they actually damaged the cam chain. <laughs> I had to tear the whole entire bottom end apart in order to fix, fix the issue. Um, some of the newer crankshafts actually don't have the markings on them. Um, usually they're engraved in the, the, on the outside web. And what we're looking for here is I believe there's some markings that identify like the category or essentially the size of the crankshaft and how that crankshaft is matched to the actual crankcase via these numbers as this engine is coming down the assembly line, right? Correct, yeah. This, this, this crankshaft does not have the markings. So if you were going to tear this motor down any further or replace the crankshaft, you need to uh, mic out the uh, cam journals and in the factory service manual it gives you what the journal dimensions are and what category it corresponds to. Uh, oftentimes they're engraved in here on the, the larger engines, the 200s, 250s, 300s. Uh, the, the 150s, I've seen them both ways and this one does not have it engraved into the crankshaft. Uh, a couple things you want to check. You know, just kind of a visual on the crankshaft. We'll set it back to top dead center from that mark I have on the flywheel. Again, supporting the cam chain every time I turn it over. Kind of uh, give this a feel. There should be absolutely no free play whatsoever. Uh, when you say free play, are you talking back and forth or up and down or both? Uh, just up and down, you know, basically the force that the piston would uh, give, give on there. And there's a needle bearing underneath this. And normally a crankshaft, because this thing is moving up and down, normally that's the free play that is extremely de detrimental. And that's because you know, a lot of force is this thing is firing and getting shot back down yeah. essentially as a result of the combustion. We see people run their engines out of oil and it usually will take this bearing out. Oftentimes the rest of the engine will survive uh, the oil starvation. But for some reason, this the big end bearing is the first thing to go. A uh, very expensive part and much more labor intensive, change out the crankshaft. Um, you know, obviously you would hear like a distinct kind of knocking noise to the engine when it runs, if that bearing was on its way out. Um, you also want to check the small end. There's the actual measurement. You can use an inside bore gauge if you want to get, get nitty gritty with measuring it and compare it with the, the specifications in the factory book. But oftentimes you can just give it a good look. There's no grooves or galling in this uh, pin, so it's in good condition. So it's safe to suspect that the small end's in good condition. You can see it's a very, very precision fit. It slides in there nice and freely. So I, this motor's got low miles on it. Wouldn't suspect that to have any problems. I imagine that's also a good way to test it. Yeah, if you ever try and slide this thing in and out and it binds it all. Binds a little bit if it's galled up. 
you know, as if it had oil starvation. You know, there's one thing I noticed on the cylinder, actually, Robot, if you want to flip the thing back over, you talked about how it's stuck and you specifically hammered on this side. I think that's those two alignment dowels. Yeah, the alignment dowels, you see one started to pull out. Uh, high miles motors, I see these completely rusted in there. At that point, it would be safe. A good idea just to replace them. And to be honest with you, I'd probably just replace those and they're included in our kit. Real inexpensive part. You know, but these you, ones, so this one's gonna come out easy, but it's got some rust on it. You're gonna wanna clean up it before you reuse it, but it's an inexpensive part, might as well replace it. So this it's one. a machine steel spacer that fits in an aluminum crankcase and an aluminum cylinder. Yeah. And so you can see a little bit of that corrosion and rust that's transferred from the steel onto the inside bore of the crankcase. A robot like you can see kind of, I would imagine when this stuff is all clean and fresh, it just slips in there basically effortlessly um, as and it, it should be. And there's a tip that removing these, if you ever, you can see the bolts actually a, almost a, quite a tight fit in there. If you just squeeze these with uh, pliers, you're gonna distort it. If you just drop a bolt in there and then squeeze it, got it. it's gonna come out without distorting. If you distort them, they get, oftentimes they'll be Unusable. Yeah, right. unusable, and they'll be stuck even further into uh -huh. this. So, uh, these ones possibly could be reused, but it'd be a good idea just to change them out. And it sounds like you've had experiences where those can get stuck in there. Correct. Yeah. Pretty, yeah, pretty bad. And you obviously use the the tip. You don't want to thread the bolt that was in there, but just put that in there. Got it. And go ahead and use vice grips or some type of you know channel lock style plier to grab it. All right, we're going to quickly go over inspecting a cylinder head. You obviously want to make sure these are tidy before you reinstall them on any rebuild, especially in this case because we're doing a performance one. You want to make sure everything's nice and tight. So Robot's going to show you a couple simple little tests that you can kind of do at home uh, to kind of see how well these valves are actually holding pressure, holding vacuum, however you want to look at it. All right, uh, you can see in here is your combustion chamber, kind of an egg shape hemispherical kind of combustion chamber. The larger valves, your intake, the smaller ones, your exhaust. The spark plug comes right through there. That's an oil passage. Um, we didn't put, the, oh, never mind, sorry. No. <laughs> um, basically, you wanna, with the cams out right now, we'll pour water in the intake. This is your intake on the top here. Let's pour it where it's almost all the way up. And just watch it for, I don't know, you give it about 30 seconds or even a minute. And if you see a drip coming through, uh, it means your valves aren't very well sealed. Uh, needs further machining, most likely will need new valves. It may need the, uh, the, the actual valve uh, seats cut and also possibly the new, uh, new guides installed. It's all stuff that a specialized machine shop can do. Uh, we can handle the whole service of rebuilding these heads. Uh, look on our webpage. We have a form to fill out, and you can mail us the head, and we can further inspect it, clean it, and rebuild and replace the parts as necessary. And again, like we're doing this quick little test here, but if it doesn't pass this test, you know the the short the the the, the short details is basically either send it to us or take it to a quality machine shop that is familiar with like small displacement four-stroke engines and can actually you know carry out the rebuild of the head. So intake's holding up good. This is a low mileage motor, no, no leakage. Every once in a while you'll see a little bit of wetness and um, ideally it might be worth lapping the valves. Um, something that's you know, kind of a little bit beyond typical home mechanic stuff, but um, this one looks good. Pour the water back in. Try the same with the exhaust. It's more likely to leak through the exhaust just because the exhaust valve runs at a higher temperature. Fill that up. So we're going to repeat bum da dum da dum da dum It looks, oh yeah, you know, this, this motor's only got a couple thousand miles, so it's, I don't think it's going to leak. If it had 20,000 miles, maybe it would start to leak. 40,000 miles, definitely time to probably just overhaul the head if you're pulling out. Cool. And that looks good. Uh, last check you want to do is uh, make sure this surface is perfectly flat. Uh, first of all, you need to clean all this uh, excess carbon and gasket material off. You do it with a straight edge razor blade. It usually comes right off. You know, you can kind of see how to scrape it right off without scratching the surface. Uh, you might want to use a little hardware cleaner. You know, but it cleans up pretty easy. 
Uh, this little hole is your oiling hole. You want to um, blow that hole out with carburetor cleaner, brake cleaner, air, something, because you don't want any of this debris that we scrape off going into your oiling system. So kind of, there you go. Give it a little cleaning. Close right through into the actual cam, cam passage. You can kind of look at that in detail. So pretty clean here. Uh, you want to check the head. Uh, you could do it on a, a piece of tempered glass, uh, a ground piece of marble would uh, be an ideal flat surface. Um, machine shops usually have a micro flat, which is a high, highly polished and ground uh, hardened metal surface that's perfectly flat. But the glass is good enough. And basically, you set the head that's cleaned up on it, and you kind of push on each of the corners, and you don't, you shouldn't feel any rocking whatsoever. Um, another way is to put a straight edge across, you know, in diagonals, and check with a feeler gauge. Check with a feeler gauge, and in the service manual is the actual uh, the the limit of how much uh, warp it could have. If it has any excessive warp, this can be uh, resurfaced, you know, which is basically skim a very thin coat off this and re re refinish the machine surface, and it will look brand spanking new. If it's if we did that. I rarely ever see them uh, warped. I mean, if the engine was severely overheated, as if the fan came off, maybe you'd have a problem. And again, in the event that you found some sort of warpage in the actual flat surface here, again, that's the type of thing that you'd send it to us or send it to your local machine shop, and they can actually surface grind, you know, this flat again. And at that point, then you're going to have to experiment with different thickness of base gaskets and such, right? Because you've removed a little bit of material? Yeah, or? correct. Yeah, you would. You know, it's a little more complicated. Rarely ever have to see an issue where these need to be recut. Oftentimes the valves will leak. Again, one thing you want to keep up on is your valve adjustment. You know, if you let the valves get too tight, you're just going to end up burning up the valves. And, and how sense. often do you honestly need to check the valves on a motor like this? Say with the stock cylinder, and then part two of that same question with uh, the performance cylinder. It's every uh, 7,000 miles. The first time you want to check is at your 3,500 mile service. I think is a 5,000 kilometer service, and then after that, it's every 10,000 kilometers, so or 7,000 miles approximately. And honestly, at every 7,000 miles, how often are they actually out of adjustment? Assuming um, sometimes the first interval, you'll find the exhaust slightly tight and the intake slightly loose, and make an adjustment there. And oftentimes, they'll hold the valve adjustment, you know, typically for 20,000 miles, but it's recommended that you inspect them yeah. just to check. So. And that's one thing that has actually like a, a simple indicator of like a high quality product is how well valves will stay within specification adjustment. It's not unheard of for, you know, some of the Chinese, like the lower grade Chinese GY6 motors to literally need a, need a valve adjustment every thousand miles. So uh, if that's the indication of some screw you've got, uh, <laughs> something else might be more serious wrong. Seriously yeah, wrong. If, if the valves start going out of adjustment more frequently, you know, some people actually log how, how far out of adjustment your valves are. And if they go, if the rate of adjustment, or the rate they go out of the uh, factory specification uh, is increasing, then it may be time to do a mach you know, re-machine the valve seats and install new valves. You know, off oftentimes the metals will start wearing at a rapid rate as they get higher up in the sure. mileage. And they'll wear initially when the, the motor's breaking in. All right, we'll clean this up just a little bit more, and this, this will be ready to reassemble. Cool. New Melosi cylinder um, is to actually use a detergent based like cleaner. This is like Purple Power, uh, available at any auto parts store. Uh, same thing, it's kind of like a simple green type of product. All you want to do is have a few like nice, clean, brand new paper towels ready. So, what you want to do is just kind of spray the inside of that a little bit, and you want to pay attention to starting with a new towel and wipe that thing. You kind of want to wipe it, and you want to wipe it until it comes out perfectly clean or all you see is the actual purple, purple power. Robot has said that, again, a tribute to the quality of the Melosi stuff, that you only really have to do a couple passes with that before it gets perfectly clean. So I'm going to keep working on that. Robot's going to talk about you know, the next step ahead of this to uh, install the top end. Uh, we're going to go ahead and prepare the piston. I've already cleaned the piston. Again, they're pretty clean to begin with. Uh, note about how this piston's installed. 
engraved in the top of the, the crown of the piston is a little like triangle and it's like an, basically an arrow pointing towards your exhaust and it's like kind of a standard marking that's found on any type of piston. Uh, you think this piston looks symmetrical but there's some small variations on how it's machined. There's a little valve release pocket right here for the, the intake valve and that's why you need to install it in the correct orientation. So the arrow points down, so it would be oriented like this. We're going to go ahead and put one of the wrist pin clips in. Uh, easy way to do that is put the pin in. Uh, we're going to put the one that's on the side of the cam chain because that's the more difficult one to access. You see this piston pin just slides in there perfectly. You know, if it's clean, it's going to slide in very nice. You know, there's no, no binding or anything. Um, again, take your really, really good set of needle nose. I like the Matco ones because I, I like, I mess these things up. I like to like, just twist them up and mess them up. And the Matco guy is pretty cool. He just gives me a new set every time. <laughs> you know, you pay a lot of money for these like expensive tools. You got to take advantage of the system. <laughs> some tools, yeah. some tools too, <laughs> you got to spend money on. And a good pair of needle nose, like Robot said earlier. Uh, that's one of those tools. So basically, you know, kind of, you can see the little relief, release right there. You know, kind of curl, you basically start to, the clip in there and kind of give it in a curl, curling action. And you can see it kind of pop a little bit too far. You could actually use your wrist pin to pop it back in. You know, I went a little bit far. I kind of pushed it back in. And you can see the clip. It's, in the groove all the way around. You absolutely need to make sure that clip is in the groove. You know, right there, it's a little bit popped out on the top. And just double check your work, because if there's any chance that that clip comes out, it ruins the cylinder, the piston, may seize up the engine at high speeds. So that clip's in, go ahead and remove this. We're gonna go ahead and put the rings in. Don't need to prepare the rings in any certain way, but keep them clean. You have five different rings. This kind of, uh, bronze looking one that has like kind of a, a chrome looking face on it is your top ring and it's kind of a marking on there it says in some sometimes they say top or have some other markings the markings always go face up which is face up. Yeah. so that's going to be your your top ring you see the last one we install there's your uh, middle ring and it's a cast iron kind of gray ring again there's an in face that down you have uh, the two oil control scraper rings. And these do not have any marking. They're symmetrical on both sides. And this is like a, basically a constant tension spring for these rings. It's a little difficult to install this first one, but I'll show you how to do it. Uh, the gap for this, you have your arrow here. The gap goes up there. It's this larger groove. Actually, one thing we'll note here on this piston, it's cool, you can kind of see those like oil, oil reliefs, right? Because essentially oil sticks to the side of the cylinder walls and this bottom ring, basically, it's called a scraper ring because essentially it's kind of scraping the oil off the cylinder wall and it works its way back and lubricates. Does it lubricate the small end bend? The small no, end bend? I think, I think there's oil that's just sprayed up. There's actually a jet that's found inside here and okay. it actually sprays oil up into the cylinder and keeps everything well lubricated. Uh, see the gaps right there at the top. You want to make sure that does not overlap. They kind of just basically butt, butt into each other there. Uh, you got two of these. Take the first one and kind of put it at, I don't know, what's that? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock or something. Other one at 2 o'clock. And again, you know, there's like piston ring expander tools. Notice it like really not necessary for this yeah. style of piston that's kind of more of an automotive thing i would say right robot yeah and on the tool wall right here i do have the factory tools that you know, compress these you know the, the ease installation i don't know just gotten to a point where i just if you don't wear gloves doing this kind of have more of a feel for it no problems doing it by hand so there's that gap there let's put this other gap which kind of comes around about at two o'clock and you'll notice that he you know, put the one ring on from the bottom side of the piston and the other one over the top so you're not fighting with the other ring while yeah, you're trying to put it in. Yeah, you're not snagging it. So that one's popped in there and you can see the grooves. Right now the grooves look like they're like eighth of an inch, three millimeters. 
So there and there. And essentially, each one of those steel thin rings is actually basically making a sandwich out of that scraper ring. Mm -hmm. So it's like an Oreo. The scraper go. ring's the white filling, and the uh, other two rings are the actual brown cookie. Your uh, lower compression ring with the end facing up. You can put a little past four o'clock right here. And again, I actually do have a tool that spreads these rings to install them, but I'm not, not going to use it because I'll show you how to do this at home, and you can totally do it with your own hands. I uh, don't need any special tools. Make sure you don't snag or scratch the uh, skirt of the piston. You know, that thing is in there perfectly. If you kind of grind it, sometimes it'll pump its seat a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, you, know, you may, may damage the groove a little bit. This ring will bind up a little bit. Don't want that to happen. So right there, there's our arrow, last ring. Again, the end facing up. That one's usually the easiest. You start with the hardest and work to the easiest there. All right, so have that prepared. And we've kind of gone through and uh, made several passes, like we said, with the purple power. And so the cylinder is basically clean, ready for like a final quick little oiling. Yeah, they do. Uh, some, some people I've seen just smear this whole thing with oil. You only need just ever so, you know, just like a little bit of oil. Do you like that much? And we saved our final clean paper towel. Clean paper towel that's dry and just basically rub it all around into the thing and it should be, you shouldn't even feel the film. Basically you're just oiling the, the actual honing crosshatch pattern. You're putting a real microscopic layer of oil in those um, grooves. If you over oil the uh, cylinder, you risk, risk the chance of uh, a glazing glazing the rings and cylinder, which oftentimes you won't be able to build the, uh, the compression that the, the cylinder kit can theoretically have, and you may end up with a higher oil consumption. Actually having less oil is actually a little bit better. Some people actually believe in installing these things completely dry with no oil, and it's a real common practice in the dirt bike, you know, with these Nicosil cylinders, because you want the, the cylinder and rings to break in real quickly. Uh, the piston, on the other hand, you want to put a, a small amount of oil on the skirts. And just right there, a little bit there, a little bit there. Just the oil you want to use is either the engine oil, the non-synthetic engine oil you're going to put into the engine, or a two-stroke oil will work just as well. Um, cylinder goes on this direction with the cam chain tunnel. Arrow points down. There's the uh, tensioner. You want to pre-assemble this here. Okay, so there we go. Rag will just kind of keep the cylinder from slipping around on the metal bench. Um, your gaps are all still in the same spots. And again, with your bare hands, you kind of want to squeeze the gaps. You watch the gaps. The, um, you do not want the ring to pop out of the groove, you know, and, and bind up. That one, the first ring slipped right in. Again, the second ring. Kind of use your nails. And one thing about these, any of these cylinder kits, some of them are a lot more difficult than doing the stock cylinder just because they have a thinner wall and the taper that allows the piston rings to slide on is a lot smaller. And the oil control rings, they're the most easily damaged ones, so take take extra precaution, slide them in, kind of watching them, making sure none of them are, are popping out. Take your gudgeon pin or wrist pin, whatever you want to call it, gudgeon pin, I guess is British English term form or something. Oil that up, small amount of oil. And the cylinder is actually prepared to install onto the, the engine. Robot's gonna work on the gas, but that can only go one way. We'll get Voodoo maybe kind of panting over. And we'll quickly show kind of what we've done to actually kind of lay out all of our hardware and bits. Um, you know, obviously for a guy like Robot, this step definitely isn't necessary. Uh, for a guy like myself that has basically done this two times now and all I've ever done is kind of stand around while Robot actually did all the work. It's nice to actually have everything kind of spread out and clean so you can always have a visual on all the parts and stuff like that. There's nothing worse than rebuilding an engine uh, and not being organized and then seeing one little key washer, some sort of key retainer sitting on the workbench and knowing you got to go back in and redoing the whole thing.
and grab the two uh, dowels. Oftentimes you just want to replace these. These dowels are included in our um, group of parts um, that are recommended for the installation of the Melosi kit. Put a small amount of oil on doesn't take much and that will keep them from seizing up if there's ever a chance that you need to go back into the engine. Pop that in. Remember those little alignment dowels that we said we're, we had to fight a little bit with to kind yeah. of pull out. They slide in, you feel them seat. Uh, cam chains right, right here. Crankshaft still set at top dead center. That's where you want it. Pistons uh, ready to put on here. Or, I mean the cylinder piston assembly that we assembled in the previous step is ready to go. So Steve's kind of holding the, this out of the way. I not, put a small not, amount of oil on the, not, um, not very good okay. <laughs> uh, the wrist pin's all, all lubricated. And you can kind of see it from the backside, get, getting the wrist pin into the small end here. And may, you may need to steer the piston a little bit. I've seen sometimes too where a robot will actually take a piece of like safety wire and actually loop it around that so you actually have like a bit of a leash. So if you're doing this by yourself, you can actually pull on that leash and keep tension on that chain. Another, another technique, sometimes you just drop a needle nose there there and it Once keeps- it's fed through, okay. Yeah, keep, keeps weight on it. So got the wrist pin in there. It's all the way through the, uh, the small end. Again, we want to pop a rag in here. There's a, uh, a likelihood that you may lose a clip. And I did put the, the needle nose there, but <laughs> well, we got yeah, I, I normally would have a couple of needle nose out. I, I have a whole bunch of favorite needle nose. But again, this rag is actually, I'll hold this chain and we'll actually yeah. probably cut here. But again, this rag is in the event that that retaining clip, which we've kind of said over and over again, are one of the trickier things about really doing this entire project. Uh, it'll disappoint you pretty quickly if that thing pops out and shoots its way down the crankcase. Now I install this. You just added a few hours to your rebuild if that's the case. Uh, pop it in the groove. Again, you want to inspect it. <coughs> you know, make sure it's in there. It's a little dark on the side. You know, use a flashlight. Just make sure that clips all the way in the groove. I, mean, I kind of know the feel when they drop in. I still double check them because it's a very expensive mistake if that clip comes out. So there we go. We pop, pop our cam chain holding tool back in. <laughs> <laughs> Made by Matco. Matco. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, this, the cam chain guide right here. You kind of got to watch it as we're going to slide this uh, cylinder, cylinder down on the piston. If all the, the rings are installed correctly, you'll be able to rock this down. And there we go. It's starting to go down. Watch this cam guide. Oftentimes it will get caught up into this uh, cam chain tensioner hole here. And just continue to slide it down. Hits the dowels. You may need to do a little, little bit of rocking to get it onto the dowels. There you go. And I'm using the four tenths of a millimeter gasket. Which uh, is never, the thinnest one, remember we said? Yeah, no, no problems. Engine's at top dead center. Um, there's a, a factory tool for measuring the squish. It's pretty complicated to use. I've used it plenty and plenty of times. Every time it comes down to uh, around the same measurement. So I don't think there's that much tolerance in these motors that they, they're outside the limit you know, of what the squish should be. And what's that tolerance you technically check? No, actually technically the thickness of the cylinder? And um, you make up that difference with a combination of gaskets here? Correct. You just uh, basically the three different gasket variations for the base gasket are determined by that by, tool. by a measurement in, with this tool. And you'd basically install the cylinder without the rings and uh, and base gasket and you put a dial gauge in here that's zeroed out at this surface and there's three different measurement ranges that will give you a resulted uh, base gasket. In layman's terms? Technical shit right here. Yeah. Technical. And I've, I've found you never really need this for the installation of the Melosi kit. You'll be fine with the 4 tenths uh, base gasket. Robot stamp of approval. That's always good. All right. So that's in. Take your, your lower tensioner. Drops right in. Basically lift the chain. A little like little fork thing drops right into a little groove. I just pretty much threw that thing in it and it went right where it needed to go. <laughs> so. 
And Robot keeps saying to you, you know, that the motor's still been at top dead center. Obviously, stating the obvious here, but the easy way to tell that is when the piston is at the top of the cylinder. Uh, that's an indication. Two dowels, the larger dowels, you know, uh, make sure they're... Is there a top and a bottom to that? No, so there's just... Concentric? Yeah, concentric. They're both the same. Drop right in. There are some Piaggio engines that do use um, a step, step style of that. Thing. So those are ready to go. The head gasket's ready to drop on. There you go. Again, that's the head gasket from the Melosi kit in this case. Yeah, make sure this deck surface is absolutely clean. You may want to uh, spray a rag with some brake cleaner and give it a wipe. I didn't get any oil residue on it. If you do have any oil residue on it, you want to make sure it's absolutely clean. But notice both the head gasket and the cylinder base gasket, you don't put anything on them. Like we talked about that nice, uh, the cylinder base gasket, the greenish colored one has that nice like embedded silicone ring uh, that creates like a killer seal. So the head gasket kind of has a springiness to it. It's a, it's actually a steel gasket that's coated with some type of, you know, special coating. Some special high temp coating or something? Yeah, and it kind of, you got to watch it because as you're sliding the head down, it will want to kind of slide around. You want to make sure it's uh, keyed with the dowels there. Uh, our head's ready to go. Again, do, do, do a last little clean in. Make sure it's perfectly clean. You know, again, it doesn't matter if you have the cam installed at this point. Do all that once you have the engine ready to go. Now you can kind of say bye bye to the internals of the motor. Have a good life. It's going to be a lot of explosions going on. <laughs> Fun time. And we've got, uh, might be jumping the gun a little bit, but we've got our new set of uh, head nuts. This is a nice flange nut. These also included in that, you know, hardware kit that we offer to, you know, aid and assist in installing the cylinder kit the right way. So those four flange nuts, those will be new and replaced. Uh, 12 millimeter uh, socket. Uh, get, get them all started. Um, in the Melosi book, they indicate 24 newton meters for these head bolts, um, which comes, comes to around uh, 17 foot pounds, something like that. Uh, the newest specification from Piaggio is 28 uh, newton meters, which is closer to 20 uh, foot pounds. And are we going to step torque these like you kind of commonly do on motors, or yeah, what do you recommend? Correct, yeah. And some some of the Piaggio motors are more complicated; they require a uh, torque angle. But these uh, air-cooled motors are a little simpler. It's just a, a torque setting that you need to do. So when you step torque stuff, it's essentially you torque it, and you know, everybody's got the different theories. But commonly, it's kind of three different torque settings. Uh, so ultimately, you'll wind up at the final torque setting, uh, which we set on this one. What was it? Set with seven. We're going to go to. Uh, uh, 28 newton meters, which is right around 20 foot pounds, and that's okay. the latest Piaggio um, specified torque for it. In the Melosi book, it specifies 24 newton meters, 17 foot pounds. Uh, that's perfectly adequate, but um, the newer engines they have, they may have made a uh, design change to the actual studs so you can go to the higher torque on them. So, what are we going to actually do our first round of torquing at? We'll do it uh, set the 7 newton meters. 7 newton meters or um, foot pounds? We'll stick with the new meters. Okay. It's kind of the factory. You can find plenty of charts that convert it, or if you have a fancy torque wrench, it kind of will do it for you. I'll grab a 12 millimeter uh, deep socket. All right. Uh, Steve's helping me with these side bolts that uh, uh, tension the the cam channel, uh, tunnel channel. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start torquing these in a crisscross pattern. I have them all hand tight at this point. So we're going to do the first round around seven foot, uh, seven newton meters. Watching display on the branch. So there's seven, and Steve's going to bottom those out. I'm kind of watching my next step. I'll go to sixteen, sixteen, sixteen. 16, we'll go to 20, 20. So Robot's kind of basically, he's step torquing it, but since we've got this really nice fancy digital 
uh, torque wrench, he can actually just kind of watch the display. Yeah, and and that, suit, the, that, that serves as his step torque. And I have the setting on it, and the final torque is set to 28 newton meters, and it beeps when it stops at the right of the torque. You want to keep a constant rate when you're torquing this. You don't want to go faster or slower on it. And you can see I'm just using a deep socket. You don't want to use extensions with this because it's going to, um, your torque, torque is going to be off if you have a long extension on there. So they're all torqued. Next ones will torque the, um, I think it's 12 newton meters, like eight foot pounds, something like that. How'd you bring the deep on the other one? Oh, I got the deep out here. Steve's trying to jump me on the tools, but I already got them out here. So. <laughs> there we go. So all the critical head bolt fasteners are all torqued. Uh, ready to go ahead and assemble the, put the cam all back together, put the rockers in there. Uh, you need to have assembly grease. All right, we have all the valve train parts laid out. Uh, a couple things you need to put assembly lube, you know, things that have metal to metal uh, uh, wear on it because it takes a couple seconds before the oil pressure builds up. You need, so I have assembly lube on the cam lobes, the cam rocker, uh, rocker hard faces, and the pivot pin, a real thin coat. All right, I got the cam and rockers all in, and I started to get the sprocket on there. Again, very important, set your flywheel on the top dead center. I uh, made a mark in an earlier step. Uh, then 2V, the little arrow needs to point right at the pit. Um, you put a little pressure on the campaign tension and kind of see where it is. You know, if, it, if it's off by a tooth, then you need to uh, joggle the cam, sprock it around. You know, either way, it needs to be right there and verify that it's the top dead center. So. Um, top dead center on the cam, you want to check your valve clearance. Uh, four thousandths or point, uh, ten hundredths of a millimeter. Right now I got these fancy little fielder gauges that we sell. And this drag's just perfect in there. This should have a slight drag in there. So you don't need to adjust the intake. The exhaust on the other hand, this is a little tight in here. This is a larger measurement, six thousandths, uh, fifteen hundredths of a millimeter. So we're going to go ahead and loosen this uh, exhaust valve just ever so slightly here. So leave the fuel gauge in there. Uh, you can use an 8 millimeter um, little closed end wrench and a flat blade screwdriver to do the same thing as this uh, valve adjustment tool here. So I've cracked the lock nut and back this off. And I just, you know, right now it's too loose. I'm kind of using my fingers to hold the thing and I'll go ahead and right where it touches down and just back it off ever so slightly and then go ahead and hold this and tighten the lock nut and now that's perfect it just drags ever so slightly. Valves are now adjusted you can put the rest of the, um, the decompression system the counterweight kind of goes on those two little valve pegs that pop out um, you can use a four millimeter uh, allen fastener here oftentimes I'll just get this started the next step, you're going to want to put the um, cam chain tensioner in. Gasket's included with the Melosi kit. Install the cam chain tensioner. Uh, two small screws, install it. Pop the spring in. Pop this, and this will tension. You'll hear the, uh, the ratchet action of the, um, of the cam chain tensioner. I'll show you how it works. Made the ratchet kind of noise there, and you'll see that the actual plunger retracted. Now there's no, no free play in the cam chain. Uh, after you get this tight, put the cam chain tensioner in there. Just snug it. It doesn't need to be over tightened. It's, um, I think it's five newton meters for that fastener there. You want to install this tensioner. You may want to use a small amount of grease to hold this little plastic doohickey in there. Drop that in. Kind of back it off from top of the center just ever so slightly, then go back, pop the spring in. The spring actually catches this lobe right here, then it wraps all the way around right there. You can see the spring is caught there, and caught right there on those two kind of lobes, and it keeps tension on this, this mechanism right here. Uh, 
three holes. The smaller hole lines up with the four millimeter fast fastener in there. Put the six millimeter uh, fastener tightened with the eight millimeter wrench. Tighten it to uh, around eight foot pounds, 12 meters. And we'll go ahead and tighten those all up, button everything up, and we'll uh, get the shrouds back on this engine. Um, we'll re reinstall the air injection tube. You can either put a block off plate or a brand new copper gasket. Reinstall the valve cover with a brand new O-ring. You want to use a small amount of grease to um, keep the O-ring in the in the groove of the, of the actual valve cover. It kind of won't sit on its own, so you need to smear some grease all the way around. That. Tighten all these screws to 12 meters, 8 foot pounds. Boom! The motor's back in. So basically, you got the engine pivot bolt, uh, the spacer, the springs back in there. I used my spring puller pull in. Uh, these two clamps for the brake liner in. Uh, there's another clip that will go here once we get the belt cover. Tighten this little uh, clamp here. We put this back together at a later time when once the wheel's on and adjust it accordingly. Uh, there's the hose for the um, carburetor vent. It actually goes through that little loop right there. Uh, the intake manifold's bolted down. New intake manifold gasket. You want to put a little dab of silicone on the gasket to keep it in place. Otherwise it might slide between the cylinder head and uh, the shrouds that go around the cylinder. Don't want to have to take the shrouds apart. Um, put a new exhaust gasket. I didn't show that. You want to use a, a pick to pry the old exhaust gasket out, and then use like a 21 millimeter socket. Tap the new new gasket back in. Uh, shock bolts in there, and tighten accordingly. There's a, the nylon locking nut has been reused. It's still in good condition. And we're still apart with the transmission because Steve's going to go over uh, disassembly of the final drive and replacing the gear set in there for an overdrive. Go ahead and walk around this way, Boo. We'll talk about like the couple of things that have been reinstalled over here. Uh, we did mount a brand new tire. It's pretty sick. 130, 70, 10 hiding now. 130 is like 10 millimeters wider. Uh, they actually, on all the Vespa 150s, whether it be ET4, LXS, LXV, you can actually get away running a 130. It's kind of a cool option. Uh, you know. More uh, fatter tire, more rubber in contact with the road equals good news. So we're still going to pull that stuff apart, so we'll get into that in a separate video. But, you know, we've got our new uh, O-ring installed behind the uh, secondary oil strainer cap. We went ahead and put one of the uh, Melosi High Flow like a uh, tighter micron filter oil filters on there. We're filled up with our, uh, you know, break-in oil, which is a conventional oil like we talked about. And then this nylock nut has been torqued down to the correct specifications. This is the front mounting nut that connects the actual, you know, forks of the actual engine to the actual rubber uh, buffered swing arm. All the electrical connections are made. Uh, the hoses are back into their respective clips. Uh, pop that connector in, the two connections at the starter, the little hose that goes to the intake manifold that also ties to the, um, the diaphragm on the air injection system has been reconnected. Little clip that you can pull back. That secures the hose. Um, don't see it, but the, the tube that goes between the air box and the valve cover, the crankcase breather hose have been reinstalled. We used a brand new uh, worm gear style hose clamp, much easier to use than the original one-time use clamps that are on these scooters. Pretty close with everything engine-wise at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah, spark plugs hooked up, but the most important thing other than tightening the critical fasteners is make sure you put oil in the engine. <laughs> Believe me, people do make that mistake. They get so excited that the motor's back together and forget to put the oil in. Start it right up and damage is already done. There you go, taking the brakes off. Uh, we're going in here to actually get access to the final drive gears. Remember, we're putting those uh, nice pointy ones in here. So there's bolts around this perimeter flange. Using a 10 millimeter socket. 
removing these things. The reason the brakes have to come off is there's that one screw that's buried back in there. God, there's weird noises over there. Uh, once this is off, remember we've already drained the oil. Um, we're pretty much ready to pull this off. There's a couple of uh, safe tapping spots here. Robots come in with a little a fancy tool. Simple, small little slide hammer. That's that final bolt. Um, I'm not even 100% sure. I think we're replacing that gear and that gear. Correct. All right, in order to get those off, on the other side of the motor, the uh, entire kind of belt is removed, the clutch is removed. The clutch essentially rides on that axle, right, Robot? Mm -hmm. This gear will pop off. Uh, this this uh, gear gets reused. It's actually a press fit on here, so we'll use the hydraulic press to swap out that one gear. This complete axle gets replaced. All right, so we're actually going to quickly talk about the actual final drive up gear kit we're putting in from Polini. Part number on this one is P202.1389. Uh, the teeth count is 17 on this little pinion gear that pushes all the way through. Essentially, the clutch rides on that, like we said, so this is the new Polini one going in. Uh, we just barely pulled the cover off, but that's it for reinstalling that one. That's the easy one. Uh, 44 teeth on this helical kit, more ring gear. This is the new Polini one. Uh, like Robot quickly said on the other one, it actually presses on to this shaft. This is one application where you absolutely have to have a hydraulic press. Uh, we can provide the service for you if you want to, you know, send us this piece. Uh, also, this isn't that complicated for any uh, decent uh, automotive repair shop that has a hydraulic press and knows how to use it without messing stuff up. Uh, obviously, when this is all taken apart, we're not going to reuse this gasket. Uh, so take that off, clean everything, clean the residue gear oil out. Um, we're going to head over to the hydraulic press and press this thing out. Oh, and I guess we'll talk about the, the actual gear ratios. We counted the uh, stock gearing in this bike. And remember, the Pliny is 1744 and the stock gearing is 1546. Well, there's an intermediate gear here, which I think affects the final, you know, up gear difference. All I know, I'm not a technical guy, is I've got this installed on my bike. And my scooter will indicate like almost 80 miles an hour when I'm cruising down the highway. And the best part about it is it doesn't feel like it's going to explode. And that's primarily attributed to the fact that this is making it so it's turning fewer RPMs to go that kind of speed. Heading over to the press now. All right, I'm going to go ahead and press this small little uh, stub, stub out of the, um, this gear here. So we'll set the gear. I already have the table all set up. Drop that in, center it with the, the punch. I'll put a, another driving plate in there. And we'll go to town with this. Uh, once, once you kind of get pressure on it, everything's centered. We'll hang on the, away from it. Oh, the bottom of the machine will be the gear that's going to pop. There we go. Just gave birth to a little gear there. And here's the old gear. We don't need that anymore. Uh, take a little grease or oil. Oil up that. We'll set the new Pliny gear. And I don't know if it really matters, but I always have the Pliny face on the outside. Get this all squared up, and I'll leave the, the plate out of the way here. Make sure it's perfectly centered. If it starts going in crooked, it's not going to go. If you used a hydraulic press, you'd feel right when the tension hits, and that's the gear bottoms out, and that's as far as you need to take it. And there we go, ready in, to be installed. All right, pop the gear that we pressed in back in the lower bearing. Uh, a small amount of silicone where this uh, vent tube exits. Use a dab of silicone on the new gasket to hold it in place. We'll go ahead and flip this assembly up. And may need to uh, spin the gears to get everything to engage. 
we're almost there. Now you can reinstall the uh, bolts. You do have, I think there's one bolt that's a different size and they all need to be torqued to, I think around 16 or 17 foot pounds, about 24 newton meters. Reinstall the brakes, reinstall the wheel, torque the wheel center nut, the 80 foot pounds, put the cotter pin in with the little uh, retainer. So. There it is, finished product. Uh, ready to drop the lift down, take it for a test spin. Fires up, sounds good. Again, this is the uh, Melosi 190 kit on a liter 150 motor. I don't know what else we've got to say. Run pretty smoothly. Hopefully you'll find them useful. the video is useful. Robot's going to take it out. Three, one, two, three.